All right. Anyways, we are we are debating the merits of democracy. I would like to start with some comments on democracy, if possible. Please. So, it, let me put my cut down and then, okay. So, I would like to say that I consider myself a Democrat, but not a fundamentalist Democrat. Okay, and, and a Democrat not in the sense of uh, uh, being in favor of the Democratic Party of the United States. Okay, a Democrat in the sense of defending democracy, but I'm not a Democratic fundamentalist. Okay, and, and the reason for this is that democracy, uh, that what I truly believe in, okay, is in good rulership. Okay, my belief is in good rulership. And democracy is not the end, but the means toward good rulership. Okay, and sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So that's why I'm not a fundamentalist, a fundamentalist in the democratic sense, because sometimes it is not the best way to good rulership. And, and then we can talk about what good rulership means and all of that. But democracy is the path toward that. And there are some problems with democracy that make it so that in certain occasions it is not a good path toward achieving good rulership. Uh, I can think of three main reasons, okay? The first is the speed with which um, things can be done democratically, okay? If you have an immediate uh, decision that you need to make as a, as a ruler, okay, let's say you are a democratically elected president of a country, okay? Uh, it's obviously, if you have to ask everyone to be in agreement before you take action, obviously it's going to take longer than if you just take action by some other principle. So that would be a first issue. The second one is that democracy, in order for democracy to work perfectly, it, we assume okay, that uh, the people are perfectly knowledgeable of their interests and are willing to vote democratically on those interests. Okay. And then the third option and, and the third problem that I have is that democracy can be easily corrupted, uh, especially because you can actually um, make people believe in things that are not in their interest. And you can make people vote in favor of things that are not in their interest. So those would be the three main uh, problems that I have with democracy. But in general, I believe that democracy is a good path, and it's actually possibly the best path that we have toward achieving good rulership, okay? And why? Well, the first reason that I have is obviously because democracy uh, uh, enforces checks and balances on the rulers, if working properly, uh, checks and balances on the rulers that, mm, in a sense, pressures them toward uh, needing to make take action in favor of, let's say, the common good even though I don't think that the common good exists as such, but, okay, in, in that abstract sense, it forces them to at least try to pretend like they care about the common good. And then the other reason is because democracy, it is a, a let's say, a reasonable way of getting people outside of power. Not just it's good for people to be pressured toward doing good things, but because it's also a good way to take off people who are not doing okay, okay? Uh, otherwise, you would have to do a revolution or some kind of thing of the sort, which I'm not against revolutions, okay? I think that revolutions sometimes are perfectly uh, justifiable and perfectly uh, well, I morally... Well, think, I think what, what, what democracy supplies you with then is not so much um, like the... It, it, it supplies democracy you with... Democracy expands the definition of revolution. Well, it gives you the possibility of talking about revolution instead of simply like a, a tyrannical usurpation. Because when, when we talk about like tyrants in, in Athens, for example, we're, we're effectively talking about uh, revolutions <clears throat> that resulted in a restructuring often of like the social order to the benefit of, of some lower class or to the benefit of somebody else who wasn't benefited by the older um, official regime. Um, but we only really start talking about it as revolutions when we have a notion that uh, legitimacy derives from the ascent of the the uh, individuals who, who comprise the social body, right? Now that that's a revolution as opposed to simply a takeover by some subservient class or whatever. That's illegitimate. Like there's there's something about like a, a tyrannical takeover, 
even though again like these we, we associate tyranny today with like somebody who puts their foot down onto the poor um but in actual fact what we were what we're typically talking about historically is is, is people who came to power with the support of the poor against uh those who ruled by established religion or something like that um having a democratic background sort of supplies you with an additional criterion for legitimacy that means that you don't only construe that kind of usurping action with um with the the, the fact that it goes against you know like all, all these these good things like tradition etc yeah so so I, my my main point is basically yeah. that democracy is probably the the best way of bringing about good rulership okay it is not Ideal, it is not uh, perfect, but it is possibly the best one that we currently can think of within the the, the social laws that we have to work with. Okay, but, but uh, San, I think you were meaning to say something. I just um, <clears throat> I was adding into the idea that one thing that democracy allows us to do is expand kind of like the limit of how we think of revolution as a concept. Because if you just go back like 350 years ago, revolution only meant the violent overthrow of whatever was the head of that state. Um, the only way you can meaningfully have a revolution within empire is to dethrone the metropole. Democracy allows us to reimagine that concept and literally have it as a transferal of power. Democracy is the only thing I can think of that allows for a peaceful transition of power. There's no way to peacefully overthrow an empire. I'm Irish, trust me, I know. And one of the things that I like about how Victor was describing democracy is because it really strikes at the home of that democracy is at the end of the day a tool. And the thing that I absolutely love about it is that it has this sense of kind of like, there's almost an incoherence that I love about it, where that it both dilutes and concentrates power, where it never allows a small group of people to gain power, but it allows a huge amount of people to gain absolute power. I really like that. But at the same time, that absolute power can crumble if you lose the support of the people. Um, just to further aside from that, because I hate the term, if you lose general consensus support, if you lose a quorum, um, that that power collapses. And for me, government is all about how you, I guess, how you provide a check upon legitimacy, where that where that legitimacy comes from, where it's derived and where it can be taken away. And the thing I like about democracy is that it provides for itself its own set of checks in that it doesn't give you access to total power, but it gives you access to enough power. Uh, I see we have Clifford Bates in the audience. You're welcome on if you'd like Clifford Bates. No pressure. Um, it's uh, I, I have no maybe, idea what time zone. Maybe we should have somebody on that uh, doesn't like democracy because he really seem to like democracy. Commander Neo, really... the spotlight is on you. you. You've been arguing about this in the chat extensively. Now's your time to shine. <laughs> There's a link in the chat. Come in at your own risk. May um, I? Uh, so I, I want to point out to at least uh i'm not like super pro or anti-democracy but there's at least two cons let's say that uh, maybe we can talk about uh the first is that well i think that at least on our representative democracy as it is in the united states uh you kind of make sure because of the system that is implemented that the people that actually end up ruling are careerists who are ultimately are not the most virtuous people, which let's say in a, in a monarchy, you can have the chance, like by chance, the monarch that happens to be ruling is just like a a good ruler, let, let us say. And the second one is that, um, and this goes to the point that like, let's say even a, a race of demons may be able to rule perfectly in a democracy, right? So the idea is to like uh, construct it in a way that it, it just has the checks and balances necessary so that you even if demons are in the in the place that we are that you have the best rulership but i don't know if uh a community that's structured in that way in sense of uh just providing a, a naked set of rules to, to be followed will be able to let us say create a community that is able to achieve a common good if there is a su such thing or uh even 
bring about the, the goods of the community. I think you're completely correct there. Democracy has this potential, and, and this is why normally democracy on its own is not a, the, the, the only means toward good rulership. I think that it's one of the ways, but it's not obviously the only one. You It needs to be complemented with other things, and especially it needs to be complemented with a, certain features, certain factors of the economic structure of a society that, in my opinion, need to be met in order for democracy to function correctly. Now, we can talk about democracy within the context of liberal democracies, okay, which which are the ones that we are used to in in the in the so-called West, okay. And these kinds of democracies have many flaws, and one of those flaws, especially here in Spain, is what you pointed out: is the creation of a sort of class of politicians that are just politicians; they don't do anything else, and they live off, uh, in a sense. Uh, leeching from the institutions, leeching off of the institutions, the democratic institutions that are in our country, and these people are no good to society. Okay, A lot of these people are no good to society, but yet they still are there and they hold powerful positions and they earn good livings. So one of the ways that I think that this can be uh, done away with, okay, probably not the only one, is with a solid uh, socialist structuring of the economic uh, infrastructure of, of our society okay now uh, this is probably not going to be the only thing that needs to be done but this is one of the necessary conditions that i would say need to hold because today's democracies in the west have a lot of problems and i think that most of those problems can be tracked back to inequalities to inefficiencies in the mode of production that in a sense a uh, enforce uh, uh, an incentive structure that makes it so that there are these mistakes, there are these problems in today's democracies. Okay, so I think his point was very good, but I think that this is not a flaw of democracy in its own. This is a flaw of a society that has democracy but doesn't have other things that need to be satisfied. Thank you. Uh, before we continue, uh, Clifford, am I to take <coughs> that you are uh, Professor Bates? Yes. How are you doing? Hello, alive. Uh, alive, alive and well. I mean, probably, uh, probably not as much after listening to this. But. Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, I would just say we need to distinguish democracy from. I mean, democracy is just a type of rule. Okay. Yes. Yeah. It is one of the forms of rule, um, um, and it, and it's it, and it 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 deals with a kind of rule of, uh, 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 in one sense we distinguish it as a form of rule that it's above the uh, uh, of a multitude it's 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 the rule of the many okay it's the rule of a people okay uh, as opposed to the rule of a few oligarchy or the rule of the one a monarchy right it's it's a and therefore the nature of the rule the justice of its rule will depend upon the nature and character of the people hmm. that if you have a if you have a people who are restrained and decent, who are moderate in their wants and demands, you'll have a just rule. But if you have a people who are rapacious and, and envious and uh, 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 grasping and wanting, then you will not have a just rule. You have an unjust rule. This is why, I mean, I would respond that socialism is incompatible with democracy in this sense, because socialism's perception relies on a kind of envy that is antithetical to a just multitude. The just multitude must be satisfied with its own. I mean, this is the famous line from Aristotle book four about the question of the danger of the rich and the poor. The rich, the rich uh, who are always, they always command, they have everything. So therefore they command and dictate and they won't tolerate, to be not, they will never tolerate being listened to, I mean, the, the, the foul. They, they're used to being in charge. The poor are just used, they're, they're kind of always lacking without. They don't have the means to, to live their life. So therefore, you know, Aristotle talks about the mesos, right? Well, you, you need the middle class. You need those with enough resources of sustenance that they are not a threat because they, that they don't have the lack. So therefore, the question then becomes, uh, and this, this, this assumes two problems. One problem is, um, how small your society is. Because democracy, as it originally meant, was for small communities. Uh, the political rule was the world of small communities, of 
couple, you know, a couple of no more than a couple thousand people. Okay, and uh, of that, only about thirty percent actually participated in politics. Right. So therefore, um, uh, you could have a situation where all the citizens could participate. Right. But but there's a problem. This is the classic problem. Uh, the problem is as that grows, as a um, as anything grows too big, participa participation from all ceases to happen. And what ends up happening is you get a either you 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 get a self-selected few who will participate, and the others won't participate. And therefore, what happens is eventually everything turns into all. As this is the famous uh, 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 Moscow's and. Um, uh, uh, Mikhail's uh, law of oligarchy, that, you know, any large scale social community, as it grows larger and larger, is eventually going to be more and more oligarchy. It will, it is, it's the problem of participation. And the way that democratic defenders of democracy tried to resolve this was the problem of representation, right? We, we create representative bodies. So, I mean, I, I would just say, listen, I mean, Democracy cannot be just. I mean, I, I stand with Plato in that sense. That uh, 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 and the problem of democracy always is going to be. Um, uh, it's it's uh, no. I mean, I would say on Plato saying that no actual regime is just in the sense. All political life in this world is always going to be imperfect. You're never going to get a just system. <laughs> You're only going to get uh, imperfected political life. And is this of a that, critique of the system or the critique of the society? No, it's the critique of both. The system and the society are interconnected and interlinked. Uh, yeah. uh, it's a kind of a chicken or egg problem. Okay. Yeah, but ninety percent of what you've said has been outlining the problems with democracy, but very little outlining the problems with society. That's oh, no, no, like no, if, uh, if, uh, if this that, is a both. Yeah. If if I may, I think I think the disconnect is he's he's talking about the conditions which democracy conceptually presumes so what you're talking about when you're talking about society you're talking about um an aggregate of subjects that are conditioned by that history clifford is talking about um in, in under what circumstances does democracy as such actually apply without like well, a, a ton of augmentation let, let me even make a more radical claim the state and society are siamese twins they're the same thing this that this that just different different focuses. I mean, they share ninety percent of their body, but they have two minds. Okay, the society focuses on one direction, and liberalism wants to put a divide between state and society. Okay, that there is a in other words that society should limit the state and authoritarian or even socialistic visionaries would argue the state. Or some other thing, a party should alter the uh, society. Okay, so I mean, I don't even like that. I think the state and society model is completely uh, a totalitarian system by its very nature. I think that the ancient orders of kononoya of community, of organic community based upon small uh, uh, structures, uh, uh, and, and that uh, uh, and that the only way to preserve larger scale political units. That, that don't revert to despotism uh, uh, must be federative by having uh, a, like a Swiss kind of, not necessarily as uh, a decentralized as a Swiss model, but like the idea that you have every community on its own self creates representative bodies of its own. In other words, uh, um, that I, uh, democracy can only work in this sense uh, always as a local community, as a local entity. If and I may. Anything if I may quickly, Professor Bates, yep. um, I, I like I like that characterization of a state and society as Siamese twins. Yeah. But I'm going to now deploy that to retort to your uh, argument um, in agreement with Plato that um, society that a, a democratic society cannot be just for the simple reason um, that it appears to me, and I, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this, that the idea of justice that Plato deploys is itself historically a Siamese twin with the uh, democratic subject of ancient Athens. So, yes and no. Um, yes, because you're right. It is de dealt with the thing, but also there's another problem. There's the whole Gemeinschaft. There's a whole problem here of Gemeinschaft versus Geschellenschaft. 
of in other words, uh, this this the nature of ancient world. The ancient world lived in a world of a, 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 a gemeinschaft, which is kononoia, which is community, which is organic, which is non-voluntary. It's a product of it's a product of of customs and habits of shared life together, where the shell shaft uh, or society is contractual. It's rational in the Weberian sense. It's a Weberian rational structure, uh, like the state. The state, <coughs> now, this is why the state and society are Siamese twins, because they are, they're both based on consensual, the nation of consent, even the, even the origin of the word society in Latin, right, societas, which was a corporate contract. It was the contractual contract between parties to form a, a business enterprise or a treaty re relationship between one city and another city. So the origin of the term society, this is, this is, by the way, why society emerged by the early liberals. The early 16th century, 17th century liberals coined the term society to overcome the limits of koinonia, which uh, and community, which, put, uh, which understood our obligations were not voluntary. That our it, obligations are involuntary. In uh, nice. Clifford, can I can I say something? So first of all, yes. uh, thank you for thank you for your uh, points. I think they are good points, but I, I would like to start with uh, the, the the from the beginning because I, I I listened to everything, mm -hmm. but I couldn't say anything until now, uh, and then move forward. So first of all, mm -hmm. you were claiming that democracy is dependent upon the nature of the people of a given society. Right, so that democracy is not going to work properly if the people of that society have certain inclinations that are uh, not morally good. Okay, let's say. Now, I I would agree with you on that, but to some extent, because obviously this is not the only causal link. I think that the causal link goes the other way around too. That the the character of the people depends on the character, on the quality of the institutions in which those people live, and part of those institutions are the rulers. Of the institutions themselves. Yeah, this okay. is chicken egg. Yeah, right. This is why it, it is a chicken egg problem. Exactly. So, so I think that this is obviously not a flaw of democracy because democracy is there, particularly in 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 the sense that I was describing it before. It's there to make it uh, not certain, but to make it more plausible, more likely that good rulership comes about and that that good rulership, in a sense, reinforces a good character in the people. Okay, and, and that would be my first point. Okay, that democracy is, in a sense, what I believe is possibly the the only good path toward achieving that goal of having a good society that is characterized by good people and by a good rulership. Okay, and then the second point is that you claim that democracy is incompatible with socialism, and I, I think that is completely incorrect. First of all, because you, I mean the only reason you gave was that uh, socialism is based upon envy. And that is something that... No, okay, okay, okay. I, that's a bigger argument. That's a bigger argument, okay. and that is the managerial character of socialism. Okay. The, uh, 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 the, the nature of socialism is that there's an argument from envy and want. That's one, that's one argument. But the other argument is that the nature of socialist management leads always to uh, uh, bureaucracies and uh, control. That there cannot be popular... Um, if you're going to try to make the... Um, the, uh, uh, the, the actually, in one sense, the market is democratic. The market, the, the free market, is in itself is the ultimate democracy. But the difference is, it's, it's, it's it, it, but it's only a two-party uh, choice between buyer and seller, nothing else. Whereas the democratic system requires uh, 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 the interaction of all the parties who form the community. So it's it's the number of actors and the number of agreements. Is to the uh, is is to the same level of number of people, where a, a, a trade econo economic activity is merely trade. That's what it is. It's, it's it, between well, the two I, parties. And I mean, and and the larger economics is merely an aggregation of all those individual tra trade transactions. So uh, that's why there's I, no. I, I think that's incorrect. Okay, I think that the the macroeconomy is not reduced to the aggregation of micro activities or micro agents okay i think that's one of the main problems of neoclassical economics actually uh, the problem of aggregation and and then i i would like to say okay the the thing okay so so you now presented another argument against socialism being democratic but i i want to start with the first one you say okay and then, okay, and then anyway. to the second one. so so then 
I don't think that socialism is based upon envy, okay? Socialism is based upon the realization that capitalist economies, that capitalist societies uh, can be improved upon, okay? And the way that we can improve upon them is by uh, giving workers the ability to own and to manage the means of production with which they work, okay? And this is nothing to do with envy, okay? Some people might be envious, okay? Some people might indeed uh, want to support socialism because of envy, but socialism in itself is not uh, a system based upon envy, okay? Uh, I mean, I could say the same about uh, capitalism, okay? Capitalists were envious of the power of monarchs in the feudal societies, so they wanted to implement capitalism so that they could be the ones with who had power, not the monarchs. And, and well, okay, envy is, I'm not going to deny things, envy is a motive. For all political life, so you can't okay, escape so, envy. Right? Yeah, of course, envy is going to be there for sure. But uh, what I mean is that he, uh, envy is not, let's say, the defining feature of socialism. So I don't think that that is a good argument against socialism being. Oh, no, it isn't. I would, I, I, I would agree with you that it's not good. My other argument, I mean, I would just simply say yeah. about socialism in this sense would, would would shoot against you because I hate to say it. Um, uh, uh, if if once. You know something, America is, a, if socialism is the uh, uh, ownership of the means, uh, owns ownership of capital by the workers, right? The produ- no, 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 of capital. Then, then America, the America is socialist. America is socialist then. Because why? No. Uh, you know why? Because um, how much of uh, most companies, most businesses are owned by mutual funds. And what are the mutual funds? The pension plans and individual shareholding accounts of all the workers and working class people. The problem is, uh, uh, once you give uh, the problem of socialism is the problems of the commons, because once you once you have everyone owns it, everyone uh, if if, the, if if industries and things are owned by everyone, then what happens is if it's going to function, then what happens is some system of control has to manage it, and therefore the <coughs> managers take over, and the bureaucrats take over. So it ends up. What ends up happening is the exact same situation, and it, this is why, in many ways, advanced capitalism and uh, uh, and advanced socialism kind of reverts together, because it is nothing but the uh, the rule of managers, the managerial class. So, I think this is, sense. if if I may quickly, uh, Victor, if you just want to do your oh, final re- final response, yeah. and then we have a couple people on to talk about anarchism in particular. So we'll we'll wrap up the democracy discussion then, and we'll move into anarchism. Um, uh, please, uh, Victor and, and Clifford, if you want to make a final reply as well. Uh, no, no, yeah. no, no, I think that's... Okay. So uh, I, uh, I, would like to, I would like to say a, a couple of things. So um, the tragedy of the commons is a problem that uh, I think is ex- that exists. I, I think it's a problem that it should be taken into consideration. Uh, but I think that the tragedy of the commons... Uh, Nonetheless, it's not a, let's say, a, a, a good argument against, okay, the democratic viability of socialism. Now, let, let me let me mention a couple of things now, uh, because now, okay, socialism, you say, has this incentive structure for people to take a power for themselves and, in a sense, build this sort of managerial class that uh, is is undemocratic in the end. So maybe you start with democracy, but then progressively you degenerate to some kind of oligarchy. Okay. And and I think that uh, to some extent that could be correct, but I don't think it's necessarily correct in all the applications of socialism. I think that um, democracy, okay, in the socialist context is much better because it gets rid of the class divisions that uh, produce a lot of the tensions, a lot of the in the conflict in interests between classes that push democracy toward the path that you were describing of, uh, in a sense, degenerating into some kind of oligarchy, etc. And I think that's the main problem that we have with today's democracies. Now, uh, that, that is my point. And then you said that uh, the US today is a socialist country under my definition of socialism. I, I think it's not. I think it's not a, a socialist country. Because the means of production are ultimately owned by business owners, okay? And business owners respond not to the interests of the working class, but to their own interests. And what are their interests? Where their interests are primarily summarized by profitability, okay? This word profitability is the central, uh, let's say, defining feature 
of capitalist economies. It's what determines many of the things that we observe in the economy and in society. Okay, because many of the things we observe in in the in civil society are derivatives of what happens in the economy. And to the, to this extent, I think that the way in which we can improve upon American democracy and democracy in many other places is precisely by implementing a socialist framework within the economic structure. Okay. I, I, am going I, I don't to, know if I addressed everything, but uh, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to bully both of you into having a one-on-one -on -one conversation here at some point in the near future because I think that I think would actually be really really. Um, yeah, but, I, uh, I, I have a lot to say, but Victor's saying it better than me, so I'm just staying out. <laughs> I think I think uh, uh, Clifford, I'm going to let you go for now, but I would really like to organize that in the near future because I think that'd be fantastic. Um, and you and I still need to continue on um, on uh, shoot. Popper. Uh, Popper, we are talking Popper and Aristotle soon, but we also need to. I've actually started reading. Um, I finally actually started reading Burnham. I lost the name ah. for a second, so uh, that that will make this conversation with uh, Victor in particular very interesting. But we're going to move on to a discussion of anarchism now. So I want to say, okay. if anybody wants to take a, thank you very much, Clifford. Take, and, take uh, you care. Take bye bye. You're welcome back. Yeah, anytime. thank you. Thank you.